Today is Thursday, January 6, and we have 140 positive COVID inpatients at Silver Cross, 24 patients on vents, and 338 inpatients overall, and we only have 300 beds. Today I have a special guest with me, Mayor Tim Balderman of New Lenox, and Mayor Balderman cares deeply about our community and what's happening at Silver Cross. He receives a lot of inquiries about what's going on at the hospital. So today we will try to answer all of the questions that he gets. I've asked him to be here today and he's going to interview Dr. Chris Yudovich, our Chief Medical Officer, and Dr. Atul Gupta, our Medical Director of Infection Prevention. Welcome, Mayor. Thank you, Ruth, and thanks for having me here. Doctors, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, before we get started, I do wanna say though, Ruth, over this past couple of years, both you and the doctors and others here at the hospital have been the go-to source for the village of New Lenox. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this virus has been politicized on both sides of the aisles, locally, nationally. Uh, but what I care about for my people is getting accurate on the ground information. And you and the staff here have been invaluable. So please, on, on behalf of our citizens, I wanna say thank you very much thank for you. that. Thank you. And uh, the reason that I was happy to be here today is because it gives me an opportunity to ask the doctors the questions that people in my community and our surrounding communities are asking us. So thank you uh, for giving us the factual on the ground information. Um, I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Yudovich. I know uh, we've got some, some numbers here from Ruth, uh, but can you give me the, you know, the 30,000 foot view of exactly what's happening inside the hospital? Sure, uh, we've been extremely busy. So as Ruth mentioned, uh, we had about 140 patients with COVID in the hospital right now. And we've been pretty busy and that number has been pretty consistent for the past couple days. Uh, of that, uh, 19 of them are in the intensive care unit, 11 of them are on ventilators. So uh, to help with this, and this caused a surge within the hospital, we had to create a couple different interesting little uh, operational efficiencies. So we have shut down our elective surgeries for two weeks. We've been able to take that staff and redeploy it to the rest of the hospital as we need more staff to take care of these patients. In addition, we've taken those rooms and converted them from surgery to medical surgical rooms so we can put these additional patients in there. As Ruth has mentioned, we're about a 303 bed hospital, but we're currently exceeding that at points having 40 to 50 additional inpatients that we're taking care of. So we've been operating close to 120% uh, peak numbers for a couple of weeks at this point. And that clearly has an impact on other aspects of the hospital as well, like the emergency room, correct? Yeah, so the emergency room is extremely busy. So they are 24 seven seeing tons of patients. Uh, they're feeling a little bit burned out, uh, but they're taking care of patients and doing a great job of it. So many appreciations to them there, but it is challenging uh, as there are long waits in the emergency room. Well, and you talk about your staffing, and we do know that they are second to none here. You've got incredible staff here up and down the line, uh, all the way to your volunteers who have always been amazing here. So everyone affiliated with the hospital does a great job. But can you talk to us a little bit about the staffing and the staffing issues that you're faced with? Sure. So like everyone else, uh, we're running a little short on staff. They've been working very hard for a long period of time, so there's really been no break for them. Uh, so longer hours, you know, it's demanding work and it's, you know, not just clinical staff, it's everyone from pharmacy to environmental services, to dietary, to our volunteers that have been putting in extra hours. And, you know, some of them have gotten sick with COVID, not from the hospital, but just like any other industry, they are in the community and they get sick from the community or their kids. So it's really impacted them as well, but they've done a yeoman's job of really working hard and overcoming obstacles. And I'm deeply appreciative for them doing that. Absolutely. And I know you've done a lot of hiring of staff and whatnot, but Ruth, one of the things that I hear quite a bit in the community, uh, not just here, but everywhere, is, well, if the hospital didn't mandate vaccines mm -hmm. for their nurses, they wouldn't be short-staffed. Can yeah. you address that issue? I can. I can. Um, the mandate was not just for nurses. It was for everybody at the hospital. And we felt that it was our responsibility that when patients come here, they knew the people working with them were protected. Our, of course, our staff wears all the proper PPE at all times. We did lose some staff because of the vaccine, but I'm very happy to report that we have more than hired the number of staff that we lost. So 
The issue right now has more to do with the fact that people are getting sick and calling off. And you know, we understand that. The, this virus is very contagious and um, it affects everybody in the community. It, it absolutely does. It is highly contagious. There's no questioning that. Right. So I guess that goes to you, Dr. Gupta. What can we as a community do to try and help curb this issue? That's a great question. Um, you know, right now we're seeing uh, COVID spreading like it never has before. It's spreading like wildfire right now. It's a surge and surges pass. Um, and we expect and hope in the next few weeks that we'll be through this surge. Um, so in the meantime, the most important thing people can do right now is to avoid those large gatherings, avoid any situation where they may be spreading uh, COVID um, to other people or getting it from other people. Um, again, it's a temporary situation. The surge will pass and things will get back to where they were before. Um, but in the meantime, that will do the most good. And then of course, we do know we have lots of evidence that the vaccine prevents to a large degree getting infected. And if you are infected, it prevents the spread of COVID too. So the vaccines really do a great job of that. So there's a, there are plenty of things that the community can do to help the hospital out. That's great. And, and while we're on it, can you just talk a little bit about masking and the importance of masking and proper mask wearing? Yeah, so now that we've had these, these masks around and we've had plenty of time to study the effect of masking on the spread of COVID, there's lots of evidence that masking reduces the spread of COVID. The most recent numbers I saw were about 50% reduction um, in a well-fitting mask. Uh, cloth masks, um, if there are multiple layers, or these surgical masks do an excellent job. Um, so again, if you have to be out at the grocery store or other places you go to, wearing a mask does make a big difference. So nothing is foolproof, but it's just, and really it's a matter of consideration, just doing your small part, even if yeah. you're just going into somewhere for, for five minutes, uh, please put it on. Is, yeah, is and, and you know, what we hear oftentimes is, well, you can still get COVID if you're vaccinated, you can still spread COVID if you're wearing a mask. It's about reducing the risk. It's not, nothing is 100%, but all these layers of things, they really help. Well, and that's a great question. So we have these patients, 140 patients that are in the hospital with COVID. What percentage of those patients that are hospitalized are unvaccinated? You know, we're still seeing the vast majority of hospitalized patients being unvaccinated. The unvaccinated um, are uh, probably about 85% of our inpatient population. And the other point I'd like to make is that people who are hospitalized and are very sick with COVID are almost exclusively unvaccinated. We are seeing some of the vaccinated come in who just happen to have COVID and are here for something else, but the vast majority of the people who are symptomatic with COVID are unvaccinated. So the ones that are overall, that are hospitalized with severe COVID symptoms are the unvaccinated, that's Absolutely. what you're seeing. And if you look in the ICU, that really holds true. That's almost 100% unvaccinated in the ICU. Okay, so when you talk about vaccines, um, we've heard it said that, you know, the two shot vaccine is not uh, helping with Omicron. Is there any truth to that? Does the booster help with Omicron? Can you kind of break that down a little bit on what you're saying? So again, it's not about, you know, 100% guarantee you'll never get COVID if you get the vaccine or the booster, but the, re the risk reduction is real. If you have two doses of a vaccine, um, your, your odds of getting COVID at that point are about 50% less. And if you get that booster, it goes up to 85% less. Um, and that's with Omicron even. So um, it really does make a big difference. And again, after you, if you do happen to have a breakthrough case, you're much less likely to spread it and you're contagious for a less period of time. That's great. And, and, and I, I'm triple boosted. I mean, I'm boosted myself and triple vaccinated. Uh, and, and I do believe in it. And I've, and I've seen it myself firsthand for those people that I know that have been sick, that were vaccinated, that were unvaccinated. The question does come up then too, you know, about efficacy and, and, and how will we need a fourth shot and, and that sort of thing. Can you kind of, I know you may not have the answers to that, but just your general thought on that. So uh, we constantly are evaluating that. Sure. Okay. So we know right now getting the two initial shots and the booster is highly effective. Okay. Whether or not people will need a fourth shot or something in the future, or we need to change the vaccine itself. It's to be determined. That's something we look at all the time and we take our guidance from the CDC and we look at those studies closely and evaluate them and we'll make the decision. But as of right now, the best thing you can do is get your original series and then the booster if you're eligible. But you both strongly believe that if people were to do that, if they were vaccinated and got the booster and, and wore the masks and were respectful as far as gathering goes, here regionally, we can really do some good as, as far as cutting down on the hospitalizations and the deaths from this, correct? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and that's the other question. Mm -hmm. They're saying, are people dying from this strain, from mm -hmm. Omicron? A lot of people say, well, no one's dying from it. It's less uh, problematic. Can you address that? Omicron is felt right now to be less severe overall than Delta or other previous versions of COVID. But the flip side of that is it's much more contagious. Okay. So we're going to see um, over the next few weeks a significant increase in the number of cases. So even if it's less severe and it affects much more people, we'll still see high numbers of deaths. Okay. Another thing that I hear quite a bit from people is, well, I've already had COVID so I don't need the vaccine. I have some antibodies, I have mm -hmm. this immunity, so the vaccine's not for me. Can you address that? Well, there's several points there. Um, previous COVID does confer some immunity, of course, having an infection in your body gets some antibodies. Those antibodies will wear off over time, just like any antibodies do. Um, so that's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, with previous strains of COVID, if you, had the inf if you had the infection, you did have fairly good protection against getting reinfected. Unfortunately, with Omicron, that's no longer true. Previous infection does not really help at all with Omicron. So the vaccines are still important. And that, especially the booster is what you're saying. Absolutely. With Omicron. Yeah. All right, great. Now, just switching gears a little bit here, uh, a lot of employers require testing. We're seeing, as you see at your urgent cares, uh, at, at other centers as well, there's these pop-up clinics, whether they're good or not, there's a lot of issues with those. Uh, but who should get tested? When should you get tested? Um, should they get tested if they're symptomatic? And what are your thoughts on that? Well, I guess my best suggestion to that is, you know, contact your primary care doctor, your clinician. You know, if you're worried, if you had symptoms, if you've been exposed, then talk to them. Okay. Uh, it's kind of hard because, you know, while uh, Omicron and COVID is ubiquitous, you know, I am seeing flu, I am seeing strep, I'm seeing regular bronchitis. There's a lot of other issues that are out there. Now, granted, I think COVID is the overwhelming issue of the day, but really you should talk to your primary care doc to understand what you need to do. Here are my symptoms, here are my concerns. You know, do you need a test? Which test do you need? Where should you get tested? Be it in their primary care office, is it urgent care, or go to the emergency room. So my best suggestion is call your doctor and review your concerns uh, because uh, Omicron is prevalent. It's not the only thing that's going on out there. That's great advice because I think a lot of people, and you can't blame them, there's a lot of information and misinformation out there. And when it comes to our health, uh, that's the most important thing in the world is our health. And so, but they have a tendency to flock to a hospital or flock to an urgent care without contacting their primary physician. And I, that really, I think, is something that needs to be stressed. Make that phone call or have a televisit or something is what you're suggesting, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I can't tell you how many televisits I've done over the past couple of weeks. Uh, so when I initially became a doctor, I never envisioned that I'd be doing televisits <laughs> late at night and swabbing people's noses in our parking lot to let them know if they had COVID or not. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it's yeah. uh, the dyna dynamics change quite a bit for you. Absolutely. So, well, we do have a tremendous community, not only in New Lenox, but this entire region that comes to this hospital. These are good, caring people. They're compassionate people. You're always going to have some uh, that are outliers, but for the most part, these are really great people that live in these communities, and they are very appreciative of the hard work that's happening here at the hospital. What can they do? to support you yeah. and your staff because they really want to show their thanks and their appreciation. Well, and I think it's being appreciative of, you know, the care that you're getting. Um, talking to the staff if you meet them or you know somebody, just reach out to them, tell them they're doing a great job. When this all started, uh, there were parades and everyone's called them heroes and there were meals that were sent. You know, those were very appreciative. Now that's kind of waned off and as time goes on, it's probably what you'd expect. However, those type of things were very appreciated. Uh, so anything you can do to help your fellow healthcare provider or someone that works in the hospital to show that appreciation in whichever way you can yeah. is greatly appreciated. Yeah, let me add um, the thank you notes that nurses received and the posters. I mean, that meant the world. It did. And, um, that could help a lot right now. And, and, and the meal train too, let's just talk about yes. that for a minute. Not only are you helping local businesses out by supporting them, by ordering food yes. from them, but these the entire hospital staff may have minutes that's to right. stop and grab something they don't have a half hour or 45 mm -hmm. minute right. lunch break coming their way so where can residents find yeah. information on being able to contribute in that way as well absolutely um there's information on our website it's on social media i think you've posted it in new lennox and um go if you go online and offer to send a meal we'll take it from there so 
We're really appreciative of that. Well, I'm extremely grateful uh, for this opportunity, Ruth, and, and doctors, for you answering these questions, uh, for being so readily available to me as a mayor so I can pass that information on to our community. Again, I will tell you, we can't blame the people for being confused. There's so much bad information out there. Uh, but this is a group here that has never politicized this. You've always been about what's best for the health and well-being of our residents. I'm grateful for that. And I will tell you, my community and the surrounding communities They've been so appreciative of the information that I've been able to share. Uh, we're going to continue to do that. So thank you again for this opportunity. And to all of our healthcare workers that are, are out there, whether you're here at Silver or anywhere else, our volunteers, anyone that's helping with this crisis, and that includes, of course, the other essential workers as well. As the mayor, I want to say thank you on behalf of our community. And yeah. we're just so truly, truly appreciative. Well, Mayor, thank you. And thank you for your leadership. It's my pleasure.